Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Well, lots of stuff in the news to talk about. First of all, uh, Wall Street Journal reported that the spy agencies finally submitted uh, their report uh, that was required by Congress by the director of the National Intelligence Agencies. And uh, this, again, is like, what, what's the origin of the virus? <laughs> they don't know, not sure. Most of them all agreed that uh, it was not genetically engineered, uh, was not adapted in a laboratory. Most of them thought it was not uh, developed as a biologic weapon. Uh, four out of the five agencies thinks it was a it was spillover event, uh, as we've talked about, probably pangolin to an intermediate species. And of course, the Department of Energy and the Federal Bureau, <laughs> the Department of Energy thinks it might have been a lab accident. So at this point, Frankly, who cares? I mean, at this point, we ought to be recognizing the fact that uh, we need better public health, we need better vaccination, uh, vaccination uh, thoroughness, and if it, I mean, if it doesn't make any difference where it came from. Anyway, never mind about that. Second of all, uh, I wanted to follow up on the malaria case. Really interesting, the Texas uh, Department uh, of State Health uh, confirmed that this was actually a case of malaria from a person who was working outdoors in Cameron County. The other interesting thing is this person had not traveled outside of the United States, uh, and there have been no other uh, locally acquired malaria cases that have been identified. Now, it's interesting because, as you know, malaria is caused by the protozoan parasite Plasmodium falciparum. It's not here in the U.S., so the cases that have been identified uh, in the United States are generally a traveler who's come with malaria and then uh, the Anopheles mosquito is required to transmit. So in the cases in the United States are usually a traveler has malaria, comes back, a case, a, a mosquito bites that traveler and then transmits it to somebody else. And these Anopheles mosquitoes are prevalent in Florida and Texas. So that's probably what happened in this case. A, a mosquito probably bit a traveler that's unknown who was carrying malaria and, and then bit this uh, person. Uh, Texas generally has about 120 malaria cases a year, but they're almost always, or they're always from travelers. And the last locally acquired case was in 1994. So a very interesting, kind of unique uh, situation. Anyway, let's get to COVID. Really fascinating what's happening, a what's happening. Uh, lot of increase in COVID across the country. So if you look at those sites that we've, I've shown you before, it was down to about 35% of the, of the sites were reporting uh, increases. Now over 51% of the wastewater sites are reporting anywhere from a zero to 100 or over 100% increase. And if you look at the last 15 days, lots of red and orange dots. And that means that all over the country, there seems to be an increasing amount of virus that's being, uh, that's being detected in wastewater. For in Houston, it's been going down uh, progressively until this past week, and you can see now about half of the sites in the city of Houston are reporting a pretty significant increase in, in viral load in wastewater. And it's already up to 70% of what it was when they first started the program. So uh, a little bit surprising that it's going so, it's rising so fast in the United States uh, in the middle of summer. I, I sort of anticipated we would have a, a uh, a surge in the fall, but there's a lot of virus around and it continues to mutate. So if you go like, well, what is in there? You know, the, the one we've been following are the XBB series, XBB 1.5, which has been identified by the FDA as the likely candidate to be the vaccination target uh, in the fall, but it continues, it continues to evolve. So XBB 1.16 and EG5, a new variant, are about equal now. So there's a lot of evolution of this virus that's taking place. Now, it's not a recombinant event, so it's not a dramatic evolution, but it is evolving uh, regularly. And if you look across the United States, uh, it's all over. So EGF is, uh, is, in, the, um, is in the orange, uh, and you can see that almost everywhere there's a significant amount in the, uh, of that particular variant now across the United States. What's interesting, if you look at the rest of the world, this is really evolution that's taking place in this country and not so much in other places. So if you look at the bars, the, the blue bar here is uh, XBB 1.5, and the sort of salmon colored one is uh, the original BQ variants. This just shows as of January in 2023, 
most of the XBB uh, variants were in the U.S. And so this is something that's happening here in our country because there's still a lot of viral replication going on. So last week, for example, the um, XBB 1.16 was responsible for 17 percent of the new infections in the last couple of weeks. Uh, XBB 1.5 was responsible for 16 percent, and then the EG.5 uh, was responsible for 13 percent. So you can see these other variants are all showing up, which makes me uh, really a bit concerned because we should we should decide what variant we should vaccinate uh, against in the fall when we see what's happening in the fall. Uh, the FDA has already said, well, let's do 1.5, but that may not be the dominant uh, variant in the fall. And so it's really important that we see. And as I've said multiple times, I think probably a trivalent that got the three major variants is the right way to go in the fall. But we'll see what they do. Now, there, you know, why are, why are we not a mess then since all there's a lot of virus around, and why, you know, why aren't things worse than they are? So uh, I, there's an interesting paper that came out looking at uh, the seroprevalence in the United States. But before we get to that, I just remind everybody uh, about, we, we talked about herd immunity very early on. You know, when a new infectious disease like SARS-CoV-2 enters a population which, in which everyone is susceptible, you see this giant peak uh, of, of infection. And what we use is public health measures that everybody hated, social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera, closing, closing down certain businesses to sort of push that peak down the, down the road a bit so you don't overwhelm hospitals and all your facilities. And we effectively did that in the United States. But the idea is you just pushed it down the road, but you want to do something that's, uh, that's beneficial like vaccinating you know, your population. We did a decent job of that, but not as good as we could have. China did a terrible job. And so what you can see, this is a, a good example of here's what happens without social distancing or without public health measures. In the green, you can see you can push it down a bit. But unless you change the dynamic of that population and make them resistant, you then have another susceptible population when you, when you take away all those public health measures. That, then you have another peak. That's exactly what happened in China. So. Uh, you know, that's a simple explanation. Doesn't do any good to do public health measures unless you actually intervene in the population. So if you recall, we talked about herd immunity. Now, herd immunity is when there's so many people who have been infected or vaccinated that they are 100% resistant. Now, obviously that assumes that the virus isn't changing. And in this case, the virus is changing. But let's just, for the sake of argument, herd immunity is calculated one minus one over the R number. Remember, our number is a number of people who get infected from an individual if everyone's susceptible. And so for flu, it's like, you know, one person infects 2.5. Uh, and that is the way SARS started. It was about a little bit more infectious than flu. It was in the three range. By each time it evolved, each time there was a change in the spike protein, it got more and more infectious, and the R number kept going up to about 10. Measles is the most infectious with about 18. So. If you think about it, SARS, uh, our number of about 10, assuming everybody was really resistant, then you'd have to, you'd have, to have 90 percent of the population basically uh, immune to get to the point where you would be able to, where the virus itself didn't just keep spreading. So an interesting study that came out uh, from the CDC looking at just a prevalence study. So what they basically looked at blood from people from uh, you know, all of 2022 uh, and looked at their antibodies and to see whether or not they had been infected or vaccinated or both. And what you can see is in the United States population, uh, now 97%, 96.7% of the population is resistant either because they've been vaccinated or infected. In fact, mostly it's because they were infected. Uh, so that's really important because that's one of the reasons why despite the fact that there's a lot of virus around, uh, we seem to be doing okay. The two issues are, one, we have more resistance to the population, so we're less susceptible. And the second thing is the virus itself has evolved to be less virulent, so it's not as, it doesn't do as much damage in people. So speaking of damage in people, there's an interesting uh, genome-wide association study that was published uh, just recently 
uh, and it was a, these are Manhattan plots. So you, you, in a genome-wide association study, you can see where there's a lot of uh, uh, activity. In other words, a region that is particularly associated with the uh, uh, outcome, which in the outcome here was severity of COVID and long COVID. And interestingly enough, it, that particular region is the transcription factor Fox uh, P4, which was also associated with people who got very severe lung disease. So. Another good example of sort of retrospectively looking at everybody and saying what were the risk factors, well, people had uh, a particular variation in the Fox P4 locus uh, are people who tended to have long COVID. So lots of great information coming out now in retrospect from the pandemic, but still a lot of virus around. Uh, and again, people are going to have to be thinking about what they're going to do in the fall. And we'll talk about vaccination uh, in the fall. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, uh, congratulations to uh, Balatito Adieri, a third-year medical student at Baylor has been named to the National Resident Matching Program Board of Directors. That is a 20-person board who's got learners, residents, and fellows who work with the board on strategic goals and initiatives to improve transition from the medical school to residency training. I, apparently, just throwing people into hot water is not the appropriate transition, which is what we usually do, which is why you need people out there to <laughs> make it better. Uh, also, I want to congratulate Dr. Ann Barnes, an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, who was selected to receive the Albert Schweitzer uh, Fellowship uh, Humanitarian uh, of the Year Award. She's being re recognized for her dedication to the underserved of Houston and Harris County. Uh, also, uh, Newsweek announced its best eye doctors, and, uh, and the, of the 200 best ophthalmologists uh, and optometrists in the country, uh, Dr. Doug Koch, Dr. Bose Hamill, Stephen Fugfelder, and Mitchell Weikert were all named, and uh, Dr. Koch and Dr. Hamill are in the top 20 for top eye doctors. It's a very special uh, uh, event happened on Wednesday of this, uh, this week. This week, uh, Baylor celebrated its 80th year in Houston, and in 1943, the MD Anderson Foundation invited the medical school to join the newly formed Texas Medical Center as its founding member. The college opened in Houston on July 12, 1943, in what was then a Sears Roebuck warehouse uh, with 131 students. And four years later, we moved into our present site, the Roy and Lily Cullen Building, the first building that was completed in the Texas Medical Center. And we are honored to be part of the Houston community, community that has supported our vision to improve health care through science, scholarship, and innovation. A great shout out to all the faculty and students who've been here. Uh, our commitment to this community has been longstanding, uh, and we are really excited about our eight decades here in Houston. We could not, of course, have achieved this without the community support and the support of, our, of our, all of our faculty, students, and donors. So thank you very much. And of course, finally, uh, the movie Barbie and Ken is premiering this week, and Lily is all excited about getting ready to go to the premiere and is excited about seeing the opening. So, you know, Lily and Barbie. You can't, make, you can't make this up. Have a wonderful weekend. I know it's hot here in Houston, but I have a great place. If anybody outside of Houston have a great weekend, we're going to suffer here, but hope to see you next week.